I hope you can see my screen. Today's lecture is going to focus on primary aldosteronism, and I will give you a brief overview and then uh, talk about diagnosis and treatment. So I'm going to start by introducing you to three cases to set the stage. Uh, the first is a patient, um, uh, and what I want you to do is think about which of these patients do you think has primary aldosteronism? And based on what you think, we'll build on that throughout this talk. So the first patient is a 56-year-old man with a history of hypertension. He's had hypertension and hypokalemia for 30 years. He does not eat licorice. He does not have any signs or symptoms of Cushing syndrome. He's currently on four antihypertensive medications, yet his blood pressure is still high, 148 over 86. So, you know, think about it. What do you think your pre-test probability is? What's the likelihood that this patient has primary aldosteronism? And I would hope you all think that it's very high. He has high blood pressure and hypokalemia for more than 30 years. He's on more than three blood pressure medications uh, with low potassium. Here are his laboratories. You could see he's hypokalemic, he's alkalotic, his aldosterone level is quite high, 26 nanograms per deciliter or over 700 picomoles per liter, while his renin activity is very low, suppressed, such that his aldosterone to renin ratio is very high. So what do you think your post-test probability is? In other words, what's the likelihood that this patient has primary aldosteronism? And I would hope you all say 100% because this is a confirmed case of primary aldosteronism. There's nothing else this could be, and there's no further testing required. And I'll elaborate on this more during the lecture. Let me introduce you to a second patient. This is a 58-year-old man, also with hypertension. He was diagnosed 20 years ago at the age of 38. He's had repeated hypokalemia for the last five years. He has difficulty taking his medication, and he's been admitted to the hospital multiple times for a hypertensive crisis. He also has no signs of Cushing's, he doesn't eat licorice, and his blood pressure on three blood pressure medications is still quite high. So what's the likelihood that this patient has primary aldosteronism? And again, I would hope you think it's very high. He has more than three uh, blood pressure medications, he still has long-standing hypertension and hypokalemia. And here are his labs. He is also hypokalemic, relatively alkalotic, but his aldosterone level is more modest, 5.2 nanograms per deciliter or only 144 picomoles per liter, yet his renin is suppressed. And here is aldosterone to renin ratio. So what's the likelihood that this patient has primary aldosteronism? And I will tell you that many people I talk to will go from thinking this is a very likelihood of primary aldosteronism to seeing these test results and thinking this can't be primary aldosteronism because the aldosterone level is not high enough. But in fact, this patient does have primary aldosteronism. If you try to evaluate how much non-suppressible aldosterone production he has, you will be surprised to know that he eats quite a bit. He underwent an oral sodium suppression test where he consumed a high sodium diet for several days. And in the context of a high sodium balance of nearly 300 millimoles per 24 hours, volume expansion and renin suppression, he was unable to suppress his aldosterone production. In fact, he has primary aldosteronism. And then finally, I'll introduce you a third case. This is a 60-year-old man who typically had normal blood pressure. One day, he went to see his primary care doctor, and in the office, his blood pressure was 133 over 85. 130 over 80 in the United States is considered hypertension. In other parts of the world, it's pre-hypertension. So his doctor did a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor, which confirmed that he had slightly elevated blood pressure. He was started on chlorthalidone, a diuretic, and two weeks later, his potassium was low, 2.9. So the chlorthalidone was stopped, and now he's on no medication. What do you think the likelihood that this patient has primary aldosteronism? This is a person who has either normal blood pressure or slightly elevated stage one hypertension, and now diuretic-induced hypokalemia. So this patient is, has a potassium of 3.9, a bicarbonate of 29, an aldosterone level that's nine nanograms or 250 picomoles per liter and a suppressed renin such that the aldosterone to renin ratio is high. Now, many people would have never even tested this patient, although diuretic induced hypokalemia is a reason to test. And if you do test, many people would have excluded the possibility thinking this aldosterone level can't be high enough. So what is your post-test probability? 
Well, it turns out this patient also underwent an oral sodium suppression test, and you can see here in a high sodium balance, he was unable to suppress aldosterone. He had floridly high primary aldosteronism. So these are three cases that highlight the spectrum of primary aldosteronism, a very severe overt case that I will show you that despite how obvious this case one is, it's rarely diagnosed. Case two is another overtly presenting case that would have frequently been erroneously excluded as a possibility. And case three is someone who was almost never thought to have primary aldosteronism, yet as you can see, does have a form of primary aldosteronism. And I'll show you different examples of these as we go along. So the first question is, what is primary aldosteronism? So primary aldosteronism is a pathophysiologic form of renin-independent aldosterone production that occurs despite volume expansion, despite hypokalemia. So one or multiple foci in the adrenal gland are autonomously producing aldosterone. The plasma volume gets expanded and the juxtaglomerular cells appropriately suppress renin and angiotensin too. So this is an independent aldosterone production. Here's a picture of a nephron. This is the glomerulus, this is the nephron. So this is a cartoon of the kidney. And as you know, the vast majority of sodium and water is reabsorbed in the proximal part of the nephron under the auspices of angiotensin II. So in primary aldosteronism, since angiotensin II is relatively suppressed, this process is diminished and more sodium is delivered to the distal nephron. There, this excess aldosterone interacts with the mineralocorticoid receptor in the principal cell to induced ENAC mediated sodium reabsorption, which induces volume expansion. And in this part of the nephron, for every one sodium you reabsorb, you must excrete a cation. In this case, it's either potassium or a proton. <clears throat> so this sets up a vicious cycle that ultimately leads to cardiovascular disease. You increase distal sodium delivery, which results in more distal sodium reabsorption, volume expansion. This increases blood pressure. It increases glomerular filtration, which further increases distal sodium delivery, distal sodium reabsorption, volume expansion, and on and on, while increasing potassium and hydrogen ion excretion in the urine. So what is primary aldosteronism? It is an inappropriate, relatively non-suppressible, renin-independent aldosterone production. This causes excessive activation of the mineralocorticoid receptor in the kidney, a vicious cycle of volume expansion that can increase blood pressure, increase potassium and hydrogen ion excretion, and it increases the risk for cardiovascular disease regardless of blood pressure because the mineralocorticoid receptor is expressed in the heart and in the vasculature and aldosterone in excess is toxic at those tissues. The clinical manifestations reflect the severity and duration of this aldosteronism. It's important to know that blood pressure and potassium are dependent features as I just showed you. The higher the distal sodium delivery, the greater the blood pressure and the lower the potassium, but these are variable. You do not need to have severe hypertension or hypokalemia to have primary aldosteronism, as I'll show you. So the cardinal features are suppression of renin, and when renin is suppressed, the aldosterone level is inappropriate or dysregulated. I hope you appreciate here, I've defined primary aldosteronism without any numbers. This is a concept, a fundamental concept that we will build on as we go. So before we talk about diagnosis and treatment, let me introduce you to a few important points. The first is the variability of aldosterone production. As you know, hormones are not secreted in a static way. They're often pulsatile and rhythmic, and aldosterone is no different. It has a diurnal rhythm throughout the day, and in addition to this diurnal rhythm, it has a burst-like pulsatility. Every couple of hours, it has pulses on and off, and this pulsatility and variability is often underestimated. Here's one example of how variable aldosterone production is. Here are 50 patients with primary aldosteronism. They have confirmed primary aldosteronism. And what you're seeing is that each one of them had multiple measures of aldosterone on different days. For each patient, you can see in the black dots, different aldosterone levels on different days, and the red is the mean value on different days. And what you see is there's a lot of intra-individual variability on different days. In some people, as much as four to five-fold differences from one day to the next. And that's because the intra-individual coefficient of variance in aldosterone is pretty high, around 30% of the aldosterone to renin ratio is around 50%. So for example, in these 50 patients with primary aldosteronism, some had aldosterone levels as high as 50 nanograms per deciliter, 
and aldosterone to renin ratios in the hundreds. These are very high. But some had aldosterone levels as low as five nanograms per deciliter and aldosterone renin ratios less than 10. That's, most people would say that's very low. Another way to look at it is on one day, more than um, about three quarters of patients had at least one aldosterone level less than 20 nanograms per deciliter. More than half had at least one aldosterone level less than 15 nanograms per deciliter. And about one third of these patients with confirmed primary aldosteronism had at least one aldosterone value that was less than 10 nanograms per deciliter. So what that means is if these numbers, these round arbitrary numbers mean something to you, you can see that if you had used these for diagnosis, you would have excluded a substantial subset on any given day. So in terms of variability, aldosterone production and primary aldosteronism is pulsatile and variable. Most of the commonly employed diagnostic thresholds, 10, 15, 20, are arbitrary. We made them up. And if you use them rigidly, it can contribute to false negative case detection. You might miss the diagnosis. A single cross-sectional circulating aldosterone level is not reliable. It doesn't tell you what's happening all day long. Now, a single high level can be informative, but what you interpret as a low level doesn't necessarily exclude the diagnosis. And so we need to calibrate or recalibrate how we interpret diagnostics. And I'll build on that as we go. Another important point that builds on this is how common is primary aldosteronism? What is the prevalence of this disorder? So this is a tricky question because we have no international consensus or definition of primary aldosteronism. It is defined differentially throughout the world based on different concepts. <clears throat> so for example, you might define primary aldosteronism based on the aldosterone to renin ratio, but then you have to apply arbitrary thresholds to say it's positive or negative. For example, 30, 25, 20, et cetera. You might want to see a high aldosterone level to be convinced it's hyperaldosteronism. Uh, hyper but then you employ arbitrary thresholds to define high and low. You might say 20, 15, 10, as I just showed you. Beyond these screening tests, you might use various confirmatory tests, methods to suppress aldosterone. The problem is there are multiple different protocols throughout the world, and each has its own arbitrary thresholds. So you can see the problem here. If you use more liberal or permissive diagnostic thresholds, you will catch more primary aldosteronism. You will report a higher prevalence, but it may come at the expense of more false positives. On the other hand, if you're philosophically more conservative, you want to use more strict or higher thresholds, then you will detect fewer cases. You will report a lower prevalence, but it may come at the expense of more false negatives. You may miss more mild or moderate diagnosis. So another way of thinking about this is let's forget arbitrary thresholds. Let's forget the conventional diagnostic numbers we have created over time. Let's ask ourselves how common is inappropriate, non-suppressible, renin-independent aldosterone production, which as I described, is the fundamental concept that defines and underlies what primary aldosteronism is. And we can do that by doing physiologic aldosterone suppression tests. Let's try to turn aldosterone off and then quantify the spectrum of primary aldosteronism, how much non-suppressible aldosteronism is, agnostic of conventional thresholds, regardless of the numbers. And we did that in a recent study, although there are other studies like this, and I'm gonna to describe to you how we did that. So in this study, we sampled people from across the United States and every participant underwent an oral sodium suppression test. In other words, every participant in this study consumed a high sodium diet for several days such that they were volume expanded, their renin and angiotensin II were suppressed. And when your volume expanded and renin is suppressed, aldosterone should be maximally suppressed. And now we can quantify how much aldosterone fails to suppress. And we did this across the entire spectrum of blood pressure. We had participants who were normotensive, hypertensive, all the way through resistant hypertension. So what did we find? Here are the main findings. And what you see on the y-axis is the 24-hour urinary aldosterone excretion rate, how much aldosterone is produced in the day when your volume expanded, sodium loaded, and renin and angiotensin II are maximally suppressed. And this is what you see. Among normotensive patients, you can see that many of them had a suppressed aldosterone level and some suppressed less, some suppressed less, some failed to suppress, and some completely 
could not suppress. What you're looking at is a severity spectrum of non-suppressible renin-independent aldosterone production, which conceptually is primary aldosteronism. These are different shades of primary aldosterone. And you see the same pattern in stage one hypertension and stage two hypertension, all the way through resistant hypertension. So this is the raw data. I'm showing you the raw data. And I hope what you can appreciate is the severity spectrum of renin independent aldosterone production seems to parallel the severity of the blood pressure phenotype. Now there are no numbers here, no diagnostic thresholds. You're looking at the entire continuum of data, but we can apply arbitrary thresholds. So since 1960-ish, the definition of primary aldosteronism on an oral sodium suppression test has been 12 micrograms per 24 hours. This is a relatively arbitrary threshold, and I hope you can appreciate that here as it bisects a continuous distribution. It doesn't have any biologic basis. It's cutting this distribution, and it implies that those above this line have primary aldosteronism and those below do not. And I hope you can appreciate the limitations of such a diagnostic threshold and how silly it is, because of course the patients below this line also have renin-independent aldosteronism. It is just milder than those above this line. So diagnostic thresholds that are binary fail to see the entire continuum. But if you use them or you use any arbitrary threshold, no matter which one you use, the prevalence will be high. So for example, with 12 micrograms, the crude prevalence of overt primary aldosteronism is 9% in normotensive individuals, 15 to 20% in hypertension, and up to a quarter of patients with resistant hypertension. If you ask if one's renin had already been suppressed before entering this study, what would the prevalence be? Of course, that prevalence would be enriched. It would be a little bit higher in every category and up to 50% of patients with resistant hypertension who have a suppressed renin have overt primary aldosteronism, very high numbers. Now, had you used the aldosterone to renin ratio to screen for these individuals, you would have only caught a small subset. For example, an aldosterone renin ratio of 30 has a sensitivity of around 26% and a negative predictive value of only 80%. It's neither great for detecting cases nor for excluding the possibility of the diagnosis. And the main reason is that even in resistant hypertension, the number of indi individuals with an aldosterone level less than 10 nanograms per deciliter on the day of testing was around 25%. And this harkens back to a concept I introduced to you early, which is aldosterone production in primary aldosteronism is variable. It's pulsatile, it can go high and low during uh, periods of minutes to hours throughout the day. Uh, aldosterone level less than 10 doesn't mean that you don't have primary aldosteronism. It, doesn't, it shouldn't be interpreted as being low. It may still be inappropriate relative to volume status, renin, and sodium status. So another way to illustrate how common primary aldosteronism is, is from the Pathway 2 study. Now, this was a study that asked, what's the best fourth drug to treat resistant hypertension? And in this study, investigators enrolled patients with resistant hypertension, and a hypertension expert excluded the possibility of secondary hypertension, such as primary aldosteronism. They measured an aldosterone, a renin, calculated an aldosterone-renin ratio, and said, you do not have primary aldosteronism. And therefore, the patient was enrolled in the study, deemed to have idiopathic resistant hypertension, and randomized to spinal lactone, doxazosin, placebo, and or bisoprolol in a crossover manner. So the main finding was that the best fourth line medication for resistant hypertension was spironolactone, the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. It lowered blood pressure better than an alpha blocker, better than a beta blocker, and certainly better than placebo. But when did it work best? It turned out it worked best in individuals who had renin-independent aldosterone production. So here's the drop in blood pressure with spironolactone as a function of the log axis of renin, aldosterone, or the aldosterone to renin ratio. And what you can see is that the greatest reductions in blood pressure, 15, 20, 25 millimeters of mercury, occurred in individuals who had a suppressed renin, higher aldosterone levels, and the highest aldosterone to renin ratio. But none of these patients were deemed to have primary aldosteronism, either because their aldosterone or aldosterone renin ratio were not high enough to raise concern for the diagnosis. But I hope you can appreciate that this is primary aldosteronism. A substantial proportion of patients who were thought to have idiopathic or essential resistant hypertension actually had renin-independent aldosterone production that also responded proportionately 
to mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists like spironolactone, but also ENAC inhibitors like amiloride. Yet none of these patients were diagnosed because they fall below the arbitrary diagnostic thresholds we have created to diagnose this condition. So the prevalence of overt primary aldosteronism is high, and importantly, it's mostly unrecognized. Beyond this overt primary aldosteronism, there is a continuum of renin-independent aldosterone production, what I call the severity spectrum of primary aldosteronism that ranges from mild to severe. And this entire spectrum falls below our current diagnostic thresholds and therefore is mostly unrecognized and we need to adjust our calibration to detect it. So, you know, a key question is, does this syndrome of renin-independent aldosterone production matter? Does it play a role in the pathogenesis of cardiovascular disease? In other words, should you care? And the answer is yes. And I can present many studies for you, but in the interest of time, what I'll do is I'll summarize them. And a series of studies, longitudinal observational studies, have shown that the magnitude of the biochemical phenotype of renin-independent aldosterone production, aka primary aldosteronism, it is clinically relevant. If you're a normotensive person, the greater the renin-independent aldosterone production, the greater the risk of developing hypertension, and you can see that in these references. If you're a hypertensive person, the greater the magnitude of renin-independent aldosterone production, the higher risk of incident cardiovascular disease and death. And most importantly, we've known for 50 years in clinical trials and intervention studies that when you treat patients with renin-independent aldosterone production, there is a proportionate decline in blood pressure when treating with a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist or ENAC inhibitor. In other words, targeted therapy or precision medicine works remarkably well when we recognize this biochemical phenotype. So with all that said, now we can talk about diagnosis. So <clears throat> when we diagnose primary aldosteronism, when we screen for the disease, there are two philosophical mindsets. And I'm going to present to you two philosophies because there's no absolute right way to do this. There's multiple right ways to make the diagnosis. The first philosophy I call the purist philosophy. You know, the purist wants to eliminate all potential confounders of renin and aldosterone. And to be complete, most clinical guidelines throughout the world from different countries and different societies recommend some form of this purist mentality. So the purist will withdraw all potential confounding medications for several weeks to a month or more. That means stopping any medication that can raise renin or lower aldosterone. That includes most prominently mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, ENAC inhibitors, sometimes ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, diuretics, and beta blockers. And you must control blood pressure during this time without blood pressure medications, which is a challenge. In addition, a purist will want potassium to be normal. You want it to be neither low, which can suppress aldosterone, nor high, which can stimulate aldosterone which means you need to supplement patients with primary aldosteronism despite stopping their potassium sparing diuretics. A purist will want labs done at the same time, usually in the morning to control for time of day and diurnal variation. And to be ultra pure, you may even want to control for estrogen status, oral contraceptive agents, timing of the menstrual cycle, et cetera. So the many good things about this is now you've controlled physiologic confounders and you can calibrate and interpret your results using a fixed and reproducible standard. But there are many downsides. This is an extremely intimidating and complicated screening method. You know, most screening methodologies in medicine should be simple and easy. It takes a lot of time and effort on your part as a clinician and on the patient's part. It requires communication about blood pressure control, potassium control, repeated visits, and it's cumbersome. To provide a humbling statistic, we do a very poor job screening for primary aldosteronism. In the United States, less than 3% of patients with resistant hypertension and hypokalemia are ever screened. In Europe, the numbers are very similar also. So if we want to increase screening and testing and awareness for primary aldosteronism, a cumbersome, complicated pathway is probably unlikely to achieve that. You want a simple screening methodology. And so I'll present to you an alternative pathway. Certainly, if you can follow a purist pathway and your patient can, that's great. But an alternative, more pragmatic pathway is philosophy too, which I call don't hesitate, recalibrate. And in full disclosure, this is what I typically recommend. So in this philosophy, you measure renin and aldosterone at any time on any medication. You should never miss an opportunity to screen because if the renin is suppressed, your results are interpretable. The goal is to convince yourself 
that your patient has renin-independent aldosterone production. So step one, the renin must be suppressed. If you use renin activity, ideally less than 0.6 nanograms per milliliter per hour. If you use renin concentration, ideally less than five millionits per liter, but you can use more liberal thresholds to increase your sensitivity if you prefer. In the context of renin suppression, you must then have inappropriate aldosterone production. And this is also philosophical. If you use higher thresholds for an inappropriate aldosterone production, you will detect more severe cases at the expense of missing milder cases. If you use more liberalized and lower thresholds, you will detect more mild to moderate cases and more overall cases at the expense of more false positives. If you want a negative test or an uninterpretable or confounded test, what you're looking for is lack of suppression of renin when your pretest probability was high or an insufficiently high aldosterone level. So here, the values of this philosophy are, it's much easier, it's quicker, it decreases barriers to screening, and it usually doesn't require as much back and forth and manipulation of medications and lab tests. The downside is you have to think. You need to recalibrate your interpretations for the specific context for this patient and ask yourself, is this inappropriate renin independent aldosterone production? So it's a little bit more mental power and less physical power. So to summarize, my general advice for screening is do not delay. We already underdiagnosed this condition considerably. If you even suspect primary aldosteronism, go ahead and measure renin aldosterone in the clinic. If the renin is suppressed, your results are very likely to be interpretable and useful. You are usually the final frontier. You know, if you don't make this diagnosis, it's possible that no one else will. So you should do something to maximize the sensitivity. And in my opinion, that, lower, that means lowering your threshold for de defining an inappropriate plasma aldosterone level in the context of renin suppression and hypertension. Don't miss the opportunity to capture a positive screen. As I mentioned, washing out, changing blood pressure medications is laborious, it's resource heavy, time insensitive, and usually it is not necessary. Now, if you have a high pretest probability for primary aldosteronism and the renin is not suppressed, on a case-by-case -case basis, this is an opportunity to wash out medications and increase the likelihood of catching a case. And the medication culprits that are most at play are mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and ENAC inhibitors. These are the medications that treat primary aldosteronism, volume contract, and increase renin and lower the aldosterone to renin ratio. And they're the ones that need to be washed out if the renin is not suppressed, usually for several weeks, maybe even a month or two until you have a chance to see the renin suppressed. In my opinion, rarely is a washout of other medications necessary. You can do that on a case-by-case -case basis. So to summarize all of this in an algorithm, the indications to screen for primary aldosteronism, the main red flags are severe or resistant hypertension or any hypokalemia regardless of blood pressure, whether it's diuretic induced or spontaneous hypokalemia. Beyond that, any hypertension in a patient with an adrenal mass or sleep apnea or any suggestive family history are also reasons to screen. Screening is easy and involves measuring plasma renin and aldosterone. Once these are measured, the real task is how to interpret them to maximize sensitivity. So step one, is the renin suppressed? If the renin is suppressed and the aldosterone is greater than 15 nanograms per deciliter, in my opinion, this is an overtly positive screen. This is almost definitely primary aldosteronism in the right pretest probability. Certainly, if there's any hint of hypokalemia, you have made the diagnosis. This is almost definitely primary aldosteronism, and you've confirmed it. You may repeat renin aldosterone on a separate day in the small likelihood that this is a false positive. I call this the simplified confirmatory pathway. This is the easiest way to make the diagnosis and initiate treatment. If the renin is suppressed and the aldosterone is very low, less than five nanograms per deciliter, this is almost definitely not primary aldosteronism. And you can repeat renin and aldosterone on a separate day in the small chance that this is a false negative. Another way to exclude the diagnosis is if the renin is not suppressed. If the renin is not suppressed, this cannot be primary aldosteronism, with the caveat being, if the patient is on a medication known to increase renin, such as a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist or ENAC inhibitor, this might be a false negative, and here you should consider repeat testing after stopping the culprit medications and doing a washout. I call this the simplified exclusionary pathway. This is the easiest way to exclude the diagnosis, which leaves us with the middle ground. 
if the renin is suppressed and the aldosterone is neither too low nor too high, between five and 15 nanograms per deciliter, I would encourage you to call these all a positive screen to maximize the likelihood you won't miss any diagnoses. Here, extra work is needed. I call this the enhanced diagnostic pathway. If your patient is not willing to, go, willing to undergo further testing or not able to, treat these patients empirically with an MR antagonist. They're very likely to respond because they have low renin hypertension and because they very likely have a mild or severe form of primary aldosteronism. However, if they are willing to undergo more testing, you can do any one of a number of aldosterone suppression tests, oral salt loading, IV saline loading, fludrocortisone challenge, captopril challenge. And if there's marked suppression of aldosteronism, you've excluded primary aldosteronism. But if there's marginal or clear failure of suppression, you've likely made the diagnosis of mild to severe primary aldosteronism, and then you can pr proceed with localization and treatment options. And if you wanna learn more about these diagnostic algorithms, there's some references for you below. So I will now turn to treatment. So for treatment, I'm going to approach this from a very pathophysiologic approach. So coming back to the cartoon I introduced to you early that defines the physiology of primary aldosteronism, <clears throat> how do the physiologic uh, approaches to treatment work? So one of the most underestimated and underutilized approaches is dietary sodium restriction. As you can tell from these pathophysiologic diagrams, sodium is the substrate that fuels primary aldosteronism pathophysiology. If you restrict dietary sodium intake, you cause volume contraction, decrease glomerular filtration, decrease distal sodium delivery, decrease ENAC mediated sodium reabsorption. This volume expansion can increase renin and angiotensin too. How do MR antagonists work? As the name implies, MR antagonists block the mineralocorticoid receptor in the principal cell. This further decreases ENAC mediated sodium reabsorption. And if titrated up adequately, the volume expansion of primary aldosteronism contracts and you have an escape of renin and angiotensin II. And finally, surgical adrenalectomy. Whether it's a curative adrenalectomy to completely abolish or remove the source of aldosterone production or a non-curative unilateral adrenalectomy in bilateral disease to attenuate the amount of aldosterone production you decrease MR activation, which decreases ENAC mediated sodium reabsorption and releases renin from suppression and increases angiotensin II. So I sound repetitive because all the recommended therapies for primary aldosteronism do the same thing ultimately. They all decrease ENAC mediated sodium reabsorption to induce volume contraction. This, increase, this decreases volume, improves blood pressure control. So in some cases it may cure blood pressure and it increases or normalizes renin. It takes renin from a suppressed to unsuppressed state. Simultaneously, you will get a decrease in potassium and hydrogen ion excretion in the urine, which can result in an increase or normalization of serum potassium. So how to put this all together? Once you've confirmed the diagnosis of primary aldosteronism, the treatment of choice if you have unilateral disease, ideally confirmed by adrenal venous sampling, is a curative unilateral adrenalectomy, usually performed through a laparoscopic procedure. This is the most effective way to reduce the aldosterone production and cure it, to improve blood pressure control, to cure hypokalemia, and to improve long-term cardiovascular outcomes. And you can evaluate for all of these biochemically by looking for a rise in renin, a drop in the aldosterone renin ratio, and improvements in blood pressure and potassium control. Now, if the disease is bilateral, usually confirmed by adrenal venous sampling, or the patient is unwilling or unable to undergo unilateral adrenalectomy for for unilateral disease, the treatment of choice is medical. Now, you should always reiterate, medical therapy is a combination of dietary sodium restriction and mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. As I just showed you, the combination of these two is the most likely to be effective for your patient. What is optimal medical therapy? You should always follow your patients to see that you have normalization of blood pressure, normalization of serum potassium, and ideally an increase in renin. Seeing these, is really reassuring that you've optimized medical therapy and uptitrated the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist enough or restricted dietary sodium enough to see sufficient volume contraction to neutralize these pathophysiologic effects of aldosterone production. Now, often, we're not able to completely optimize medical therapy. Or if you treat a patient long enough over many years or decades, you run into problems. So what are some signs of suboptimal medical therapy? Well, despite maximal uptitration of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists or 
maximum recommendation for dietary sodium restriction, the patient still has elevated blood pressure, the patient still has hypokalemia or suppressed renin. Often, one of the most common problems is the patient over time develops chronic kidney disease. This results in recurrent hyperkalemia that limits how aggressive you can be with the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist and or your patient develops side effects like gynecomastia or other intolerance. So what do you do when these uh, tough situations arise? Well, you can use other medications. You can use amiloride. Amiloride is an ENAC inhibitor, and as the name implies, it reduces ENAC-mediated sodium reabsorption, and it is a very effective add-on agent on top of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists for primary aldosteronism. The downside is if your patient has chronic kidney disease, amiloride will worsen hyperkalemia risks. You can use potassium binders like pateromere or lokelma, uh, but again, those are very expensive and difficult to get. You can use other antihypertensive medications to lower blood pressure with fourth, fifth, sixth line agents. But at some point, you run into a problem. You've now prescribed dozens of medications for your patient and the additional and um, additive effects are diminishing. So you can consider something more aggressive on a case-by-case -case basis, which is a non-curative adrenalectomy to attenuate the severity of disease. Now, as this name implies, on a case-by-case -case basis, you can do a surgery to remove one side, usually the more dominant side uh, pointed out by adrenal venous sampling or, and or imaging, not to cure the disease, but to attenuate or reduce the amount of excess aldosterone in hopes that you will um, provide enduring clinical benefits. So this is particularly useful if your patient has asymmetric disease in terms of morphological imaging features or lateralization on adrenal venous sampling. If your patient already has a large burden of cardiovascular or kidney disease, meaning they're at high risk for more cardiovascular events. If they're very young or already take many medications, meaning this is an unsustainable approach for many years. Here, a non-curative adrenalectomy might make it much easier to uh, continue on with medical therapy. And several longitudinal studies and observational studies have shown that even a non-curative adrenalectomy results in durable reductions in blood pressure, improvements in potassium, and rises in renin. So to summarize today's lecture, primary aldosteronism is a common syndrome. It is very underdiagnosed and it manifests across a broad severity spectrum from mild to severe. And this is important because primary aldosteronism is likely a major contributor to what we currently call idiopathic hypertension and to cardiovascular disease. We need to detect more primary aldosteronism. One approach is to screen much more, much more frequently, and then use a pragmatic approach to identify individuals who have a biochemical phenotype of renin-independent aldosterone production that defines primary aldosteronism using thresholds that maximize sensitivity and improve case detection so that you can uh, start targeted therapy. In terms of treatment, unilateral adrenalectomy, either to cure the disease or to attenuate its severity, or a pathophysiology-based approach to medical therapy can improve and optimize blood pressure and potassium control and reduce the risk for incident cardiovascular events. So I will stop there and thank you for your time and attention and I'm happy to take questions.